Hello world, as always, I am Ryan, you are about to learn some Linux, and this is Intro to Hacking with Hack the Box Academy. So in this video, we're going to be starting our journey into the Linux operating system, and we're going to be starting the Linux Fundamentals module. Now, I'm not going to cover the entire module in this video. That would take hours. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break that module up over multiple videos. And this video is going to be about the first section in that module, the history of Linux. I'm not going to read the page verbatim and give the exact same information that's in the section. Instead, what I'm going to do is give you some additional context to talk about the history of Linux as a general overview. And this is going to be sort of supplementary to the actual section itself. So you still got to go and do the actual section. You can't just watch this video and think, OK, I got it all please go read the section and also watch the video the two complement each other they do not replace each other so let's jump right into it so I'm here at the first section of the Linux fundamentals module you'll remember in the last video we unlocked this module went to the modules page we went to tier zero we went over to Linux fundamentals and we unlocked this for 10 cubes so we can go into it now by hitting continue or start and we're gonna land over at the first section of the module which is the history of Linux and the Linux structure now a reasonable starting point when learning about the history of Linux is to simply ask the question, what is Linux? And that is a deceivingly simple question, and the answer is not as simple as you might initially assume. What really is Linux? I mean, we call a lot of things Linux. We call Ubuntu Linux, and Kali Linux, and Parrot Linux, and Arch, and Red Hat. All of these things are Linux, but they're different versions of Linux, distributions of Linux, flavors of Linux, what actually is Linux? Now, depending on who you ask, you might get a different answer. And depending on who you ask about that answer, you might get a different answer about how right the original answer was. There's actually some controversy here in a rather complicated history. So to talk about that, let's talk about how Linux first started. And to do that, we need to talk about GNU. Now, back in 1983, the operating system of choice would have been Unix. This was essentially a command line operating system that would look very similar to a basic Linux shell without any GUI today, and it was very widely used at the time. Now, unlike Linux today or maybe FreeBSD, you could not go and view the source code, make a change, apply a bug fix, add functionality. It was closed off and proprietary. And a man by the name of Richard Stallman was rather fundamentally opposed to the entire idea of a proprietary operating system that could not be shared, that could not be modified, and in fact, rather opposed to the entire idea of proprietary software in general. And he wanted to create a Unix-like system that was freely shareable, freely modifiable. So he started what was known as the GNU project. GNU is a recursive acronym. The G literally stands for GNU. So GNU stands for GNU's not Unix. That is literally what GNU stands for. And the goal of GNU was basically to implement all of the same functionality as Unix, to look and feel like Unix, but to be free and shareable and modifiable in a way that Unix just was not. And the goal was to create an operating system that had all the same functionality as Unix, that looked like and felt like Unix, but was freely modifiable, freely shareable, and open source that Richard Stallman would say could have a community built around it. So. He started working on porting over all of the functionality from Unix to GNU. So Stallman, as well as the other people contributing to the GNU project, would take what was available on Unix and they would rewrite it for GNU. So they would take the ls command, for example, and rewrite that for GNU. They would take the C compiler on Unix and they would rewrite it for GNU. We know that as GCC nowadays. They would take the shell for Unix, which was sh, and they would make a new version for GNU. We know that as being bash, born again shell. And they did this for almost all of Unix. They took whatever they could, all of the commands, the functions, the utilities, the services, and they would rewrite them for GNU and the difference being that with GNU the source code was free and shareable and modifiable and anybody could go in and help contribute to the operating system or change the operating system redistribute the operating system and you could do that because GNU as opposed to Unix was free and shareable that was the dream of GNU now, at the same time, the people over the GNU project were working on GNU. Independently, another man by the name of Linus Torvalds, you might have heard of this guy, was working on something known as the Linux kernel. Now, at this point, I can give you the technically correct answer for what Linux actually is, what the Linux kernel actually is. It is a kernel for an operating system. At the time, no specific operating system. He was just developing a kernel that could be used for an operating system. So 
What is a kernel? Well, if we go back to our academy module and we scroll down here, we'll actually get a definition for what an OS kernel is. It says, the kernel is the main component of an operating system. It manages the resources for IO devices for the system at the hardware level. And if we scroll down even farther, we'll get a definition for the Linux kernel. And it says, Linux kernel is the core of the Linux operating system whose function is to virtualize and control common computer hardware resources like CPU, allocated memory, access data, and others. So what the heck does that mean? <gasps> Well, let's take a moment to think about what your computer actually is. It's a bunch of hardware, which runs a bunch of software. You've got memory, and a CPU, maybe there's a graphics card, and your storage device, there's your motherboard, and your peripheral devices, and in your software you've got your browser, and your games, your favorite programming language. That one app your friend's been developing that he claims will make you a billionaire, but you're pretty sure it's kind of stupid whatever software it is that you're running. Now, all of this stuff needs to find a way to talk to all of this stuff, and that is not an easy job. So what you might want to do is add a layer in between that can mediate that communication. And that is the kernel's job. So the kernel's job is to act as an intermediate layer between the software and the hardware. When the software wants to do something, it tells the kernel. The kernel tells the hardware what to do and how to do it. Let's imagine you have an application written in C that wants to read a location in memory. That application is probably going to use some C library, libc, which is probably going to be glibc, a carryover from GNU. And that library will make a system call to the Linux kernel, telling it to read the location in memory. And this is true of basically anything that happens on the system. It's all going to boil down to syscalls being made to the kernel, and the kernel will be dealing with that and actually making stuff happen in hardware to correspond with what the software wants it to do. This is the job of the kernel, and it's why the kernel is so fundamentally important for the operating system. Now that is a serious oversimplification of what the kernel does and how it does it, but when I was playing this video, I decided that because it's targeted at beginners, it was probably better to go for a high-level conceptual overview rather than a deep dive into the kernel and kernel modules and all of that, so what were we talking about? Right, Torvalds. So as I was saying before, as the GNU team was working on GNU, Linus Torvalds independently was working on a kernel called Linux. He first published this in 1991, and around that time, the GNU team had finished most of the stuff they needed to do to create a Unix-like operating system with GNU, but they hadn't finished a kernel. They were working on a kernel called Herd, but this was not going very well. They had decided on a kernel architecture that was really complex, very intricate, very fancy, that was very difficult to make work, and they were having significant trouble making it usable at all. And in fact, it wouldn't be usable for another 10 years, and even then, usable is a strong word. So at this point, the community had a mostly functional Unix-like operating system called GNU that was missing a kernel, and a functional kernel called Linux that didn't have an operating system to go with it. So can you see what was naturally fated to happen here? The community took the Linux kernel, and they slapped it in the gap in GNU where the kernel was missing, and they created a fully functional Unix-like operating system that would see widespread usage called GNU slash Linux. All the work that the GNU team did, rewriting the Unix functionality, implementing it in GNU, allowing to have an operating system that would have the same tools, the same commands, the same functionality as Unix, was now enabled by the fact that Linus Torvald's kernel could work with GNU. Where Herd was not succeeding, Linux did. And this created the GNU Linux operating system, which would then go on to be the base of most of the Linux operating systems we know today. Ubuntu, Debian, Arch, Red Hat, all of these have their foundational base in this GNU slash Linux pairing. The GNU stack running on top of the Linux kernel. Now, there are some operating systems that use Linux kernel which don't use GNU. Android, for example, is one of these. But most modern operating systems that we refer to as being Linux operating systems are fundamentally comprised of this core stack, the new software running on the Linux kernel to create an operating system. And here we finally arrive at the naming controversy that I was hinting at before. What is Linux? Well, Technically speaking, Linux is a kernel used in operating systems such as Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, Arch, etc. But we tend to refer to these as being Linux operating systems. Some people would advocate that these are GNU slash Linux operating systems because they also use the GNU tech stack, the GNU software running on top of Linux, and Linux is just the kernel. They are fundamentally operating systems based on GNU slash Linux. And there is merit to that argument, but regardless of the merit to why GNU deserves to be in the naming scheme, colloquially, we do tend to just refer to these as being Linux. 
So what's the final say? Is Linux the kernel or the family of operating systems? Well, the answer could be both or just the kernel, but I tend to think that the general public has spoken on this issue by denoting the family of operating systems as being Linux. Just like the creator of GIF didn't get to decide that it was called GIF, everyone else called it GIF, so that's what it is. The family of operating systems is generally called Linux, so I tend to think that's what it is, but it's worth paying homage to the fact that GNU is just as much as part of the equation, and GNU slash Linux maybe is a more apt name. So I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't mention the fact that this history I provided is very oversimplified. This is a complex topic, both the creation of GNU and Linux are nuanced and are probably better explained by a textbook rather than a short YouTube video, so if I've glossed over things or left things out, I definitely encourage you to go do some research on your own, read about this topic, because it's very interesting and there's a lot of cool information there. Like a few of the interesting things I left out, for example, was the fact that Linux was initially published under Linus's own license, but then in version 0.99, it was transitioned to the GNU public license, which was super impactful for Linux's widespread adoption. There's a whole story there. Go read into that. And also, I encourage you to go read the Academy section. I didn't cover everything that was in the Academy section because I wasn't trying to just reiterate the same information. I was trying to add some additional context. So don't forget, go read that Academy section because it's just as important as you watching this video. Now, Linux is super important. It's run everywhere. Embedded systems, servers, most of the internet's websites are probably running on some variant of Linux. It's really important, and it's hard to work in any field in IT without being familiar with Linux, but as a hacker, it's extra important. We use Linux every day. Most of the tools we have run and are written for Linux. It is by far the best tool in your tool belt to know how to use Linux because if you're trying to do this all on Windows or even Mac OS, you're not going to have a great time. You can do it to be sure, but it's not going to be as good of an experience. Linux is a must know, and that is why it's important to understand where it came from, where these operating systems originated from, and why they exist. So moving forward into the next video, we will be delving into the Linux file system, some basic Linux commands, and learning how to actually use this operating system that I've spent the last I don't know how many minutes talking about. So I'll see you in the next one, guys. But until then, goodbye, world.